four, you go to bed at ten. Is a is a day, and you work seven days a week. Seven days a week. Um, and each day you're either doing sub patrol, or what other type of things would you do in your day? Well, it depended on like when we were down around the Philippines and Saipan and that area. Uh, we would go on dive bombing runs. Practice which, or real? Real. Okay. Uh, carrying uh, 500 pounders. And uh, you would start in, you'd get up to about 30, 000, 28 to 30,000 feet. 30,000 feet? Yeah. It's not 3,000. No. Holy and then, cow. Then you'd start down and you would dive uh, at pro approximately a 45 degree angle to the target you're trying to hit. And uh, you would drop the bomb, release it at about 1,800 feet, and then pull out and get away from the explosion that was taking place. Okay, why do you start off at 30,000 feet? Because of any aircraft fire. So you start, you're cruising at that. Right. Just to stay out of the end of the aircraft. Right. And then you, can you, do you visually see your target or? Yeah, you can visually, the, the leader of the group knew precisely where he was supposed to go to drop the bombs. So we all followed him and that was an experience I'll never forget because we were in our dive going to drop our bomb and I looked off to the, my right and there said a 500 pound bomb right off our wingtip. A guy above us had released it too soon. <laughs> and I called, it's just falling with you. Yeah, that's what I called the pilot and I said, hey, we got, we got a rider over here on our right wing. And he looked over and said, oh Christ, <laughs> he screwed that thing around. <laughs> Cause see, you can take, even though you're in a dive like this, he has this maneuverability like this or pull up. Wow. This guy I flew with, when we had drops. Your pilot? Yeah. He would, uh, let's see, out of 500 drops, he was 35 feet from bullseye. Don't, it, it was just absolutely amazing. There wasn't anybody in the squadron that even come close to it. Now, you as a gunner, what is your job during a bombing, a, a, what do you call it, a dive bomb, bombing yeah, run? Yeah, dive bombing run. Okay. My job, because that's when the Japanese fighter planes would attack you when you were in a dive because they knew you could pull up and get your guns to bear on them. So it was my job to keep those nasty little things off of us. While we're diving down, I'm sitting back here with my machine guns trying to find one of them that's coming in on us. And, and you're diving at a 45 degree angle? Yeah. Well, I tell you, you used to black out. I can never will forget that. You'd, when you'd hit the bottom of that dive, because see, we didn't have any pressure suits in those days. You were just in flight scoots. And uh, you'd hit the bottom of that dive and you could not pick up your arms. The pressure, the G's that were pulling, you couldn't, you couldn't lift your arms. And your face would just, you could feel it just sag down like this. Your head would go clear down into your chest uh, until you got out of that. And then the blood came back and you went on. The pilot, I used to ask him, I said, how the hell do you keep control? I mean, what are you doing up there when you black out like that? He said, well, he said, you know, he said, we're hitting the bottom of the dive and pulling up. He said, what we're told to do is take that stick and pull it clear back into our belly and just hang on to it and hold it right there until after all the gravitation forces have passed and then you can release and fly on. So he would pass out? Yeah, he'd black out just like I did. Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. So, um, who would determine what your target was? And how, how, did, how was that target, was there a, a, a pre, 
you know, meeting with you get all together yeah. and how many planes were part of this? Was it you or was it 10 or 50 or three or? They, uh, what they did was where they would radio in from land shore where they wanted the bombs to be dropped and they laid out panels, uh, red, yellow, uh, anything real bright to show you the area that they wanted you to drop your bombs in. And that's the way, then they'd coordinate that to the aircraft carrier and they would plot the course that you would apply and where you were expected to drop the bombs. Okay, so you're dropping it on these big pan colored panels? Yeah. Who would put those panels out there? The guys, the Army, uh, or Marines, usually the Marines, uh, at night when they could sneak by the Japanese and get that panel set out there so that they knew where they were at. So we knew where they were at and wouldn't drop it on our own forces. So, Which uh, happened, you know, with the scatter bombing that they used with the big bombers. Uh, a lot of times they dropped them on their own guys. I'm sure. Um, so I'm just painting a picture here. There's an island in the South Pacific. It is held by the Japanese. Um, the U.S. or the Allies want that island. Uh, the Marines come on shore and take over one beach. Uh, they can't get past a hill or an area right. and they designate this is where we want you to now bomb and they radio those coordinates in. Right. That's the way it worked. Did I describe that perfectly? Yes. That's just exactly the way it worked. Okay. So tell me what you would see when you were at 30,000 feet and then how would the Japanese know that you're coming? Um, tell me some of the experiences that you had with the, with the, with the Japanese planes coming in. They had, they had aircraft, anti-aircraft. That's the time when we got hit. Uh, blew a hole in our right wing. Okay, About, tell, tell, me that, tell me that story. Okay, we had just completed a bomb run and we're pulling out and they got, we got hit by an anti-aircraft shell. It blew a hole in the wing about the size of that table. And uh, the thing would, the wing would fill up with air and then it would go boom, just like a big gun going off. And the wing would fall down like this and then the pilot would gradually get it back up. And uh, we flew back to the carrier and uh, they asked him, the carrier asked him, do you want to land, try to land that thing, or do you want to ditch it? Well, ditch it meant going in the ocean. And he said, uh, well, just a minute. So he called me on the intercom and said, well, Monty, what do you want? I said, I don't feel like swimming today. I said, land this son of a buck. So he said, okay, here we go. So we got down and we were just doing great got right over that carrier where we belonged and that dead gum wing, bloom, and down it went. We hit the number one five inch gun turret, spun around, hit the number three five inch gun turret. When it ended up, there he was in his pilot position and there I was in my gunnery position. The tail section were gone, both wings were gone, the engine was gone. <laughs> We were sitting in the frame. <laughs> All safe and happy. Nobody got hurt. And you didn't have to swim. No, no. I didn't want to go. I did that once. Tell me what, how, what happened with that. Well, we were taken off, off the carrier. And when you take off, then you have to sharply bank to the right to cut off the slipstream for the guy behind you so he doesn't get caught in the turbulence. So we just cleared and we're making that turn and put, put, put the engine quit. One engine? Just when we were going around, getting out of the way. So we went into the water. Well, the first thing I did was turn around and look, see where that carrier was, because I didn't want to get run over. <laughs> and 
there was that was an experience in itself that developed uh, a complete change in the uh, oh what I call it the the raft situation. We had a big two-man raft that sit back in my cockpit up above my head and it was about oh it was about that big around and you were supposed to pull this handle and it would drop the piece down so that you pull the raft out. Oh well, I pull the handle tried to pull that out shoot I couldn't budge it I had my feet up on the dash jerking that thing with everything I, I couldn't move it. So when they picked us up, and that was a jolly ride, the destroyers picked us up. They reached out with a boat hook and grabbed you underneath your May West and jerk you up like a big fish. So you get aboard that and then they have to transfer you back to the end to the carrier. So they shoot a walkman's line, they call it, from one ship to the other. And you are in a seat where you just your legs fit through and you then they transport you back to the carrier. Well, here you are going along and the ships come together like this a little bit and you dip down and then they go apart and boing and then you, <laughs> you about fly out of that seat. So we finally got back. Well, we checked. I told them about this raft business and they went out and checked and out of 26 of our bombers, two could get the rafts out. So they radioed back to DC, the Navy Bureau, and told them the problem. Okay, so they got the guy, the mechanics, out and they lowered that drop from two inches to six inches. And then the flight crew had to go in and dust those things every morning so that they would be able to slide out. And that was learned because of your experience. Yeah, right. So were you ever able to get the raft out? No. So you, the, the plane ditches, you and your pilot are floating with yep. your life jackets, I yep. guess? May West. Oh, so when you said May West, that means that that's the thing that fits over your head and comes down and has two nozzles down here, air compressed, and you pull, and it boom inflates it immediately. So that's what the May West yeah. that you're referring to. Uh, yeah. I see. Okay, so the two of you are you together or are you? Floating? Yeah, we hung on to each other so we could be together, so they could we wouldn't drift apart and get lost from one another. And you said that a destroyer picked you up. Yes. Now. Um, why is it that the destroyer picked you up and the carrier didn't? Well, because the carrier, you've got to remember the carrier closest to the water like that is about 75 feet. And, they are, and then the flight deck is about 175 feet above water. Whereas the destroyer was probably 45 to 50 feet above the water. And the aircraft carrier always had destroyer escorts in case of attack from submarines and things like that. So the the carrier was the main was was the mama. The mama. Was the That's mama. right. And all these the destroy how many destroyers would there be in? There was usually six destroyers. What per three, yeah carrier? Per carrier. Three out in the front and three behind. And detecting to see if they could pick up by sonar uh, subs. And aircraft too? Mm hmm Also aircraft? Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, you got to remember that aircraft curve, uh, that was a costly procedure. I mean, you're talking about carrying about 360 aircraft, and that's like a floating island, and it's used in, in every way possible for invasion of the islands that we were trying to take. They get closer to Japan step by step. That's the way it was. And we, we found out later, we had been assigned, if we had invaded Japan, that we were in the leading Air Force group 
to attack. Wow. Thank God for... Yes. Um, I'm trying to think of the names of the bombs. The Little, bomb. The A-bomb. Well, they had a nickname. Little and Big. Little Boy and Big Boy. Was it that was, is that what it was? I think so. But anyway... Little something, Big something. Anyway, yeah. These people that write how terrible that was dropping that on them. Hey, saved they millions. Don't, they lives. don't have any idea what would have happened if they hadn't have. They wouldn't have surrendered without the oh, bombs. And they would have fought to the last child. Mm -hmm. Millions more would have been killed. Oh, yes, yes. Millions more of Japanese and, and Americans. Absolutely. Man, I always sit there and shake my head when I read how these people lambasted Harry for doing that. Boy. Did you have, um, you described to me the bomb, uh, the bomb runs, bombing yeah. runs. Um, did you ever have any um, air to air combat with Japanese? Yeah, we've got. Uh, Descri how does that work? How does it. Okay, they try, if, if you're flying like this, what they try to do is come under like this to shoot because they know you're blind underneath. And they come in under like this and try to attack. Either that or they come down from the top like this because they know the sun, they, they go by the sun. And if they can get that sun in your eyes, you can't see sick them. And then sometimes they will come in like this from out here like this and make a passing run across this way and go up like this. Were their airplanes faster or more agile? Or? They were more agile. The, the old dive bomber, uh, probably at the best, could go maybe 325 miles per hour, whereas the Japanese Zero could hit close to 400. A distinct advantage. Yes. Uh, but the, the thing about it was that the, the metal that was used on the Japanese planes uh, was, I say, very thin. In fact, if you go to one of the Japanese cars, and we have one, we have a Nissan, uh, the skin on those cars is very, very thin. Uh, my wife, unfortunately, was at a Walmart one day and the wind was just blowing like crazy. And the gal next to her opened up the car door and the wind caught it and banged into our car. Well, Patricia, I don't know why, but she couldn't, couldn't see the huge dent and this lady offered to give her her insurance card and everything else. And Tracia said, oh, I don't think it's that much. And didn't do anything. And so we had to take it and get it fixed, 1300 and some dollars. And uh, that metal on that thing is, is just skin. That's all it is. And that's to cut down the weight, I guess, and to get better gas mileage. I don't know. But that's the way it is. It's sure not that way on an American car, I can tell you that. So but anyway, had, that they had th th so they had thin uh, metal, or I guess aluminum, right, on, on the airplanes. Yeah. So, so they were more maneuverable. They're I mean, were they were they more maneuverable? Yes, they were more maneuverable and faster. Uh -huh. How did we overcome that? Oh, by different aerial maneuvers. For example, if we had one on our tail, and I'm flying a dive bomber, and we have one on our tail. We have what you call air brakes. These are big fins that you, by manual control, you open up and the wings, the edge, the edge of the back of the wing will come out like this. It's used for dive bombing to slow down your descent. Okay, so when you're going along and you pop those things open, it's just like slamming on your brakes. And that guy behind you, he cannot adjust that quick and goes on by 
and then we've got him in our gun sights. That's one maneuver. And the second one, of course, get one on your tail, go into that big dive. Because they can't do that. If they try to follow us in that dive, they'll tear their wings off. Because they're not made to do dive bombing. So we knew that was a weakness. Yeah. So you, it, so, um, if you were to have, did you, I'm, I'm assuming you call them dog fights, right? Yeah. Okay, you had a dog fight. Would it be one on one, five on five, five on 20? Could be any. Just depended on the number of planes that were in that vicinity. Sometimes it would be one on one. Sometimes there would be five and five, and they'd be going all over, look like a bunch of flies flying around, maneuvering, trying to get the advantage over the one they were tailing in. Describe that to me. Describe that a story or describe what happened during that well it, it's a how long does it last you know, it, oh, it only it only lasts a few minutes because it's you're going so fast and everything is reacting so quick that it, it just doesn't last that long because you're using full throttle a lot and you're using up your gas and you're trying to get in maneuverability and it, and uh, you just, it's almost by flying by what they call the seat of their pants. There's no practice maneuver that you can possibly do to avoid it. It's just whatever instinct takes over at that particular time. And, and that's the way they did it. Now, are you flying close to your carrier, out in the middle of the ocean, well, over land? Just depends. It, sometimes, sometimes it was uh, well, they were having an aerial attack on the carrier, and uh, you would encounter them fairly close to the carrier. But other times, after you've made like a bomb run and you were coming back, they would try to jump you then because. They knew your gas supply was lower than what it probably should have been. In fact, there's a big story about that. This one, we were on this one, there were three carriers involved, and we were on it out in the Coral Sea. And they had been fighting all day long. And they were coming back, and some of these guys were running on fumes. I mean, it was. I've seen and I saw them, two planes landing at the same time on the carrier deck because they didn't have enough fuel to go around. And one would try to catch the earliest wire he could catch, and the second one would come right down over the top of him and fishtail it down and try to catch another wire. That wasn't you, though. Huh? That was somebody else. Yeah, that was somebody else. That wasn't us. We were already home safe and sound. <laughs> <laughs> so, in how many battles do you think, uh, dogfight battles, do you think you experienced? Oh, probably not more than three, three or four. And how many dive bomb runs did you oh, do? Dive bomb runs? Well, I had... Uh, I would say about 600. 600? Yeah. So I had 2,385 carrier landings and takeoffs. And so the remaining amount would be uh, sub runs? Sub runs, strafing like, like uh, when we were taking the Tinian and the Saipan and so forth. And what they were doing was cutting off the other islands. So the Japanese would try to go by night or at least by early dawn in small boats trying to get them to uh, another contingent of Japanese. And we would fly by and that's where we were over the side with our machine guns strafing those small craft. And I said it always reminded me 
And one night when I was a kid playing with lead soldiers and how you'd have them lined up and hit the first one and the rest of them would fall down. That's what it just reminded me of. That's the way you'd strafe them like that and go down. Um, during the dogfights, did you actually shoot down anything? No. No. Thank goodness I didn't have to. <laughs> Why do you say that? Well, you know, that would have been a pretty precarious position if I had had to shoot one down because he'd have been on our tail eating us up alive. <laughs> what do you mean? I mean, well, you know, if he was in, if we were in the lead and he was behind us, if he was in a particular position, I couldn't shoot anyway because if I did, I'd hit my tail section. And uh, he knew that. They knew all the weaknesses and so forth. And uh, I've got a book at home about the Douglas Dive Bomber. Uh, one of the best planes the Navy ever had. They lost fewer of those planes than of any other plane model they had. Uh, I've had films showing a guy in a dive bomber, an old Douglas dive bomber, and a dog fight with a Jap Zero, and the old dive bomber beat him. He shot him down. And it was quite, a, quite an experience to watch that on, t on the screen. Now, outside of the, the physical abilities of the planes themselves, um, do you have a feeling of the, of the training or capabilities of the pilots? Oh, yes. And, yes. Okay, tell me. You do. You can tell. Some of them were very nervous. When you say them, you mean the Japanese? No, the, the, our pilots, some of our pilots, oh, our pilots flying the dive bombers were very nervous. Uh, when we switched from the Douglas to the SB-2C Curtis Helldiver, uh, they called it the Beast. And the reason they called it the Beast was because it was so dadgum hard to fly. The new one. Yes. And the pilots didn't like those planes. And uh, they were nervous about it. Because it, it had, during the time we were there, there were five different modifications on that airplane. In other words, flaws that had to be corrected. Five of them. Hmm. And that was very unusual. So the pilots like the old version. Yeah. Yeah, they wanted the old Douglas. There was, it was, we always said it was nothing but political that got it to over to the Curtis outfit to build. They didn't ask the pilots' opinions? No, no. They never asked them to evaluate them or anything. Wow. Too bad they didn't. But, you know, they were there, that's what they had to fly, so get with it. And by the way, you're, most of these, um, you know, bombing runs, uh, you know, the handful of uh, uh, dogfights you had, and the, I picture them in the South Pacific. Right. Now you mentioned that you were up north too. Yeah. Did the same type of activities happened up north. No, there was okay. not any. There, there was not any uh, air resistance up north at all. Okay. Did you do one first and then the other, or is it back and forth, or? No, we went in, went up there and bombed. Mao and tried to give Chiang Kai-shek air cover for his troops to ward them off, but that was such a fouled up situation that uh, it, didn't, it didn't work, it couldn't have worked the way they were doing things. So what type of, I guess, activities were you doing up north? Uh, strafing ground troops and bombing uh, artillery installations. And so you would have a, a, a pre-flight meeting, yeah. and this is your target, this right. is your, your right. goal, this is... Right. You know, it was so amazing. When we, toward the end of the war with the Japanese, we would have conferences and these intelligent guys would come in and talk to us 
and tell us what ships were still available for bombing or strafing, uh, what their classification, everything. They were telling us that, that uh, out of seven ships that the Japanese were building, when they launched them, five of them sunk from sabotage. So evidently... Okay, so I understand. U.S. ships would no, be sabotaged? Japanese, Japanese ships. ships would be sabotaged by... Right. Saboteurs, Japanese saboteurs. By their own people. By their own people. So evidently, it was much like Germany. There was a group that didn't want to do what... The emperor. The emperor and uh, the rest of them wanted to do. And so they were doing their best to try to destroy them. That's the only thing we could ever figure out. Because anytime you sink five out of seven that are being launched, somebody's got to be doing something wrong. Wow. Or right, whichever yeah, yeah. way you want to look at it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they could tell us where every ship was, the size of it, their armaments, everything. And this wasn't, these were not American spies. I'm sure there was, no. these were just Japanese that didn't like what the emperor was doing. Right. And signed with the went. allies. Yeah. So wow. it, was, it was amazing. Wow. We'd sit there and just kind of shake our head and blink our eyes. <laughs> That's another thing I had no <clears throat> idea about. Yeah. Well, it, I don't think it was ever publicized. I no. mean, they didn't ever give them credit for having do thing that sabotage, which they should have, as far as I'm concerned. And we don't, to this day, probably don't know who these people were. No, no. I'm sure we don't. And I'm sure the Japanese people that weren't involved, I'm sure they don't know either. Yeah. Wow. Because that we did have a lot of information about things that we what, that was not public knowledge. That's true. Yeah, you know, just like in the Philippines. Okay. When we were attacking the Philippines, the word was given, do not bomb this area of the Philippines. Well, you'd say, well, why? Well, uh, that's for General MacArthur owns a lot of land and buildings. <laughs> so we had to leave his stuff alone. <laughs> he needs his place to retire. Yes. That That's son fine. of a gun. We laid offshore when the Philippines were invaded. You know how he always said, I shall return, you know? Okay, we laid offshore three days because it was raining and he did not want to go ashore in the rain. And it never showed it publicly, but after he waded across and stomped his feet and so forth, there were his aides with towels, fresh clothing, fresh shoes, socks and everything that he immediately put on. It must be nice to be a general. God, especially him. He, he, was, he was very, very, very much disliked by the United States Navy. Hmm. Very much. Because of his... Bravado. Yeah, uh, ego. Yeah. That son of a gun. When he was thinking about running for president, I thought, oh my God. Fortunately, he died. <laughs> <laughs> Before you do that. Now you, um, uh, when you go on shore and you had, you said you had a month. On, uh, I guess R and R or yeah, is it, is it called R and R? R and R. So you have a month of R and R. Yeah. Um, and where were you? You're, I think you said we were in the, we were in Hawaii. Oh, I thought you said South Pacific somewhere. We came back. They bring the ship back to do repair work and so forth. And then during that time that it's in dry dock, we get leave. So you, you had a, basically a month off. Yeah. 
do you train, continue training, or is no, it truly a month off? No, you? we didn't do Slap. anything but sleep and find women and drink and smoke and enjoy ourselves. <laughs> so, do you? Where do you sleep during that time? This I want to. I want to know about this R and R. You know the the government had taken over a number of the big hotels along the Waikiki Beach, and those were used for R and R. You had, I was in with a, a buddy of mine, he and I shared a room together, for example, and uh, there wasn't anybody alone in a room. Everybody was, yeah. either had two or more other occupants. But we, it was nice. I mean, they, uh, I'd have to say the government uh, catered to us very nicely. So we, uh, we deserved it. <laughs> I'll agree. <laughs> and then some. So um, how would, you, you obviously need money to go out and buy a beer or, yeah. uh, how do you get paid and how does that work? You get paid every 30 days. and uh, you Even can, on the ship? Yeah. You could draw as much as you wanted. For example, if you had $500 in your account, and you thought you might need 300, you could draw 300 and leave the 200 there. Now we had another little experience. This is a nice, I guess, but uh, when Japan surrendered, okay, number one, they were not to have any U.S. contraband of any kind. That meant cigarettes or anything else. And they meaning the Japanese? Yes. Okay. Secondly, they were not to have any U.S. currency in their possession. So the game we played, when we get liberty to go ashore, it was in the wintertime, and we had pea coats, you know what our, those are, don't you? Okay. Well, we slit the lining and put in two or three packs of cigarettes because the U.S. cigarette was selling for 25 bucks a pack. So we'd get a buddy, we'd steal a, an SP, Shore Patrol, bazaar that goes around your arm, and we'd go to a corner, and one of us would stand there with the cigarettes, and the other guy would be around the side with the SP bazaar on, and you wouldn't stand there probably 10 minutes that you were not approached by Japanese to buy your American cigarettes. So when the, the, as soon as the cigarettes and the money exchanged hands, you'd whistle. And the guy with the SP Bazaar come fly around the corner, throw the guy up against the building, take all of his American cigarettes, take all of his American currency, <laughs> I was sending home three thousand dollars a month. Holy cow! <laughs> you know, all all's fair in love and war. I guess that's right. <laughs> well, then let me go. Let me go back here because we jumped ahead a little bit. Yeah. I just realized. Um, where were you when the first nuclear bomb dropped? Oh, we were in Manila. Oh, so you weren't on the ship. We were on the ship. We oh. were, we were in. Uh, well, it wasn't dry dock, but they had to give us liberty because we'd been at sea 10 months and hadn't been ashore or any place during that time except on the ship. And the, the nerves were getting pretty tight and there were numerous fights and so forth and they knew they had to get that ship someplace to get those guys to let their let it valves blow off. So we were there. and. After that bomb, we got to go into what was called Yokosuka Harbor. Yokosuka Harbor. And, and this is in Manila? Uh, no, this was in Japan. And okay. from there we got to go look at where the bomb has been dropped. First one? Yeah. Greg, it looked to me that I can remember yet, the impression I got was it looked like it had been a big oil fire. Everything was just black. 
just scorched from the heat, I guess, of that bomb. And, uh, I mean, there was nothing moving. Nothing. It was just deadly silence. So I understand. Um, when the first bomb went off, you were in Manila. Yeah. And then you all got on the boat and then hooked it up north. Right. To, to, uh, to um, Nagasaki? Huh? Nagasaki? Yokosuka Harbor, where we went. Oh, the harbor there. Yeah. Okay, but the, then uh, that was after Nagasaki. Okay, so both by the time you got to Japan, both bombs have been dropped. Yes, right. And you are now docking in quote unquote enemy territory. Territory, but the war is over. There's no yeah. more fighting. Right, right. How? Uh, describe to me what what is it? Let me back up. Um, what is the reaction on the ship after the first bomb goes off? Ray, cheered. I mean, loud and clear. So, what was the was there an announcement given over the PA system? Yes, there what, was. Just, that was it exactly. They announced that the, the atomic bomb had been dropped, and that uh, if they didn't uh, surrender, there was to be further. Do you know what an atomic bomb is? No, we didn't have any idea. Yeah, yeah right. just, it was top secret. Just a big bomb, that's all. <laughs> we wondered, oh, how big was that thing? How many tons of... Yeah. Yeah. Of course, we found out later, you know, just carried on a B-29. It, it wasn't anything exceptional in size. They'd carried bigger ones than that before. But it's the nuclear bomb that, yeah. the nuclear side of it. We didn't have any idea what that meant. None. No. But I'll tell you what, after the Japanese surrendered. Okay, so the first bomb goes off and the Japanese do not surrender. No, they do not. And then we threaten another one. We, yeah, and then they didn't surrender then. And then we dropped the second one. And then, they did. They realized they could not compete with that. Well, it was either that or there weren't going to be any islands left. Yeah. Do you know why we didn't bomb Tokyo? I, just... They didn't have to. Because the Air Force commander was using incendiary bombs. And they killed over 100,000 people in one night. With, with, the, with the nuclear bomb? No with the incendiary bombs, okay, explain fire that. bombs. They were filled with a device, a liquid, that when the bomb hit, it would spread flames all over. Okay, now this was a different, This was a. these were bombs that were dropped before the nuclear bombs? Yep. Okay, so you have the incendiary uh -huh. bombs that were dropped on, on the Tokyo. Oh, on t in Tokyo. Yes. Destroyed huh. almost three fourths of Tokyo. Killed and that, out. and that was not enough to stop them. No, the first nuclear bomb was not enough to have no. them surrender, and it wasn't until the second nuclear bomb. See, that was Tojo. Tojo was the military leader, and he said he would not give up. That if they had to fight with hoes and rakes, that they would. And, uh, of course, what we didn't know at that time was that they were using American prisoners of war in uh, medical experiments in China. They were doing that just like the Germans did. And that's why when it ended, Tojo was hung. By his own people? No, by us. By military tribunal. Hmm, I didn't know that. Yeah. They convicted, convicted him of atrocities. And they hung him. Wow. Which they should have. Sure. So, um, you get word of the first bomb. I'm going back a little bit. Yeah. Uh, get word of the first bomb over the PA system. It's, you know, hurrah. Big, hurrah, big hurrah. You bet. You, you're in, on the ship and you start heading north. And then you hear word of the second bomb? Yep. Tell me about that. Well, after the second bomb was dropped, 
we thought, you know, hey, surely those stupid people are going to give up now. And how much time was it between that bomb and the action? The, the About 60 days, I think it was. 60? It was two months? Yeah. After the second bomb dropped yeah. and, be, and before they declared a surrender? Yeah. What happened? Wow, I thought it had been like two days. No. They, uh, they didn't want to surrender. Tojo didn't want to surrender then. But uh, uh, fortunately, the rest of the Diet decided that uh, they would have to surrender. Either that or, like they said, there would be no more Japan. Yeah. And they could have literally destroyed that entire country if, they, if we'd so desired. Of course, that's when it led up to bad things with the Russians. That's when we first started having difficulty with the Russians because uh, they had stolen the secrets of the nuclear bombs. And uh, we knew it. And uh, it, was, the Cold War. it was a bad situation. And people really don't know, and I don't, I don't know, how close it actually came to us and them going to war. Well, Cuba Missile Crisis. Yeah. And, and you know, old George Patton, as crazy as they all said he was, said, we better go and defeat those bastards now because we're going to have to fight them sooner or later. Wow. This was during World War II. He wanted to go right on in. Forty years, it was a 40 years later. Yeah. It was a 40 year Cold War. Yeah. That we won mainly because of economy. Right. And freedom. Yeah. You know, and, and he, he, could, he could have done just exactly that. I mean, if they'd have let him alone. But Eisenhower, and that's one of the reasons I never could vote for Eisenhower. Eisenhower turned jelly. Said no, no. But you know, if you think about it in retrospect, yes, of course, us winning World War II allowed us, uh, we became a superpower because of World War II in the yes, country. Right. Um, but a lot of it also is because of the Cold War. Yes. The victory in the Cold War. That's right. Because we had now a common enemy being the Russians, and you know, who's the first to space? Who's the first to, you know? It, Absolutely. We had, a, we had a goal, we had a vision, and but that's a different, that's, that's a whole different. That all comes down to politics and money. That, you think? <laughs> I really do. I think that's exactly the way. Well, let's, let's finish up. Um, you've got two, uh, two months, I didn't know it was two months, but two months before, um, between the, the second bomb and describe to me what happens two months after the bomb. We then got assigned, our carrier got assigned to go down the China coast to Shanghai where there were thousands of uh, Allied prisoners. And that was the most amazing sight I think I've ever seen. Those guys that were prisoners when this was over, they had these Japanese guards and soldiers surrounded by a big ring of them. They had hoes, sticks, clubs, of any, anything they could get their hands on. And I mean they were beating the level of daylights out of those Japanese prison guards. Tied, I mean total opposite. Total opposite. Just, I mean, it was, and that you could see, you, we could watch, and that ring would get a little quieter, a little tighter, a little tighter. And were these American or Allied? Oh, these were Allies. They were British and all, oh, you know, U.S. Mm -hmm. and all, everybody. Mm -hmm. And they were had been prisoners of war, the Japanese, and had received the usual treatment from the Japanese. And boy, they were taking their wrath out on them too. No uncertain terms. In other words, payback is you a bitch. Bet. Payback big time. <laughs> so your carrier is 
uh, goes to Shanghai and picks up these Allied prisoners of war. You, we and, didn't pick them up. We just oh. flew air cover so that there weren't any outside influences coming in to disturb what was going on. And this was after the, the official surrender? Right. After VJ Day? Yes. So there were still things happening? Oh even, yeah. Oh, you bet. Okay, what, what would these things be? I, well, some of them, the, the, you know, some of the Japanese on these islands, uh, they never did give up. The only reason that they were still alive was that the United States Navy had isolated that particular island and hadn't even tried to take it. All they did was cut it off. And so those, they didn't get official word, maybe? No, they didn't know the war was over. They were still fighting. And uh, there were a number of people that got killed. I know on Saipan, uh, these guys, Japanese, were living way up in the rocky areas. And the only way they finally got them out was the Marines came up and tied in ropes. And then they would come down in the face of these caves and swing across the front of them and throw in a hand grenade. That's the only way they could get them out. Just to root them out. Just one by one. There was, uh, by the airstrip, there was this huge, huge boulder. And those son of a guns had dug underneath that boulder and hollowed it out. And it was a gun emplacement. And they were sniping from there. Days, weeks, months after that? Yeah. Yeah. And then, of course, the people on Saipan, the Japanese had told them when the Americans came, they were all going to get murdered. So that's where Suicide Cliff came in. People were jumping off, killing themselves because they didn't want to be captured by the Americans. Wow. They'd rather kill themselves. Yeah. It's you crazy. Know, this is, and again, this is after yeah. DJ Day. Right. It was crazy. Of course, mm -hmm. then the Americans used a suicide cliff to get rid of all of the trucks and jeeps and everything <laughs> that they didn't want back. They pushed them over. <laughs> God, what a fiasco. So tell me how it wrapped up. Well, we came back, as I said, we had made... Did, came back to the States? Yes. Okay, but before, let me do something real quick. You okay. did mention you went to the mainland and you saw, oh, the scorching. Do you see the scorching or do you see the nuclear bomb location? We just saw this. We saw the scorching, what it was uh, afterwards. When, well, they had it all petitioned off. You couldn't, you couldn't get by because of the amount of radioactivity that still existed. That's what we figured out anyway, but we could only go up to a certain point, and they had marine details out there that wouldn't let you pass. Any uh, stories or experiences um, being on the mainland there? No. Uh -uh. The only thing, when it was over, when we, they dropped these things and it was over, when we would go like uh, to ride on a bus or a trolley. Uh, as soon as we'd get on board, Japanese would get up and wow. bow to you. It. You are our superiors. Wow. That really gave you an odd feeling, I'll tell you. Was it out of fear or respect? I think both. I really do. I think probably mainly from the average Japanese citizen, I think it was fear. But for the above average, I think it was respect that, that they realized. You, you beat us. Yeah. Yeah. What was your feeling toward the average Japanese citizen? Was, it, was there disdain? Was it anger? What, did you feel sorry for her? No. We, the most of us, including myself, just felt like, okay, sucker, you started it. We finished it. We are your superiors. 
So it was a very, it was a, it was a trying to find the right word, uh, but but maybe maybe not. Maybe there is a pompousness, a uh, 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 dump your chest. Yeah, I think I say that so. Yeah, because because uh, no, they started it. They, we didn't feel sorry for them, not they, in any way, shape, or form. Because we didn't ask, just like after 9-11, we didn't ask for it. Just like after uh, December 7th, we didn't ask for it. Right. Right. They brought it on. Yeah, that's true. And they got just what they deserved, as far as we were concerned. The, uh, that feeling, I don't think, exists any longer, though. I don't right. think so either. Because, you know, there are thousands of U.S. citizens that go over there vacationing and so forth. We were there two years ago. Yeah. And uh, I don't think that anywhere near exists anymore to what it did. But yeah, when it was over, we we damn well let them know we were the ones and they were below us. Very you good. got what you wanted, you eat it. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, now you start heading east and you see mainland USA for the first time in how long? Three and a half years. Jeez. What was the first, what city did you come into? Frisco. San Francisco? Yep. Tell me about that. Oh, <laughs> they had to warn the guys. Everybody was going to the side of the ship. We were swinging into the docks. And they had warned the guys, get off of that, get back. You're going to turn the ship over. <laughs> and so we docked, and of course, there's thousands of people there, you know, celebrating and everything. And it what, was, date, what date was this about? Oh, gee. When was VJ Day? I can't even remember. What month? Yeah. I don't remember. 45, obviously. Yeah. It was in the spring of the year, I think, but I'm not sure. I'm trying to remember the time, the time of the year it was also. I don't, I don't recall that. So you're coming in. The crowds are waving and screaming. Golden and, Gate Bridge. Yep. Yeah, just beautiful sight. A lot of the guys when we got down the gangplank kissed the ground. <laughs> they were so happy to be back. Um, did you have family or anyone see no. there? It was just nobody probably did. No. Because they didn't they didn't uh, broadcast when the ship, you know, was going to come in or anything like that. that the, because, well, for example, when we were coming back, we had to stop at Hawaii and pick up uh, a bunch of uh, Marines and Army personnel to return to the States as well. And because it was an aircraft carrier and had the flight deck and all kinds of room, well, they could accommodate them. I can remember you get up to eat breakfast. After you got through eating breakfast, you went down and you got in line again to eat dinner. <laughs> and after dinner, you got back and you got in line again to eat supper. <laughs> it was so crowded. <laughs> and this is on the on the on the trip back. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I'm I'm thinking you get to San Francisco and you get off the off the plank and and you kiss the ground and you're like. I, I don't know what to do now. That's right. So what's it's exactly you, right? I, <laughs> and I'm just trying to put myself into your position and yeah. you you know fellow servicemen in the position. Do I go here? Do I go there? Yes. Yeah. No. Yes. Yes. No. You know it's like that's exactly right. So what did you do? Well, I got on a train and went to well they put us on a train and went to Oklahoma City for deembarkation. And but how long were you in San Francisco? Uh, about 10 days. So you partied? Yeah, big. <laughs> <laughs> partied was an understatement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Mike was a capital P. <laughs> and I called my dad and mom from uh, Oklahoma City. Oh, so they didn't even know you were back No, home. they didn't know back I was stateside. back. So uh, they got in the car and came down and got me. But you know, Greg, afterwards, you had this feeling 
you had to hurry up and do whatever you wanted to do because you didn't know when you were going to get called back. Really? You, yeah. Okay, this, it was just, you're back home now. Yeah. yeah. That's just the feeling that you had. You, you didn't want to commit yourself to anything particularly because you had the feeling that you were going to get called back. You just, you were a bundle of nerves. That's what it amounted to. Do you think you felt... Uh...